Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you're looking in the Bible in the pew in front of you, it's page 968. Matthew chapter 5. When I first came to Louisiana, I had no idea what a parish president was. In case you were unaware, no other state in the Union has a parish president. And I had no idea what that was or what it meant. I had never heard of the position before. And especially as I started spending more time out here in St. Charles Parish, I learned that the position was very important. And as I've spent time here, I've learned a little bit more about what it is and how it functions, and I'm thankful for President Jewell and what he does for our parish here, and I understand kind of what his role is. I needed to, to understand the hierarchy of the, of the parish government. When we come into a society, we need to understand what it looks like, how it functions, what the hierarchy is to, to get an understanding of it. Another example of this is every weekday morning, Haley and I use a, an app to pray for an unreached people group in the world. It's called the Joshua Project. And the reason I like the Joshua Project is because not only does it give us a picture of the people group and tell us where they are and what their name is, but it also gives us a little description about the people group. It tells us how they structure themselves. Are they a tribal people? Do they live in, in cities? Who rules them? Is it, is it shamans or or elders, or do they elect officials, or is it mob rule? And it, it helps us to understand the people and how to better pray for them because we know how the society works. So today, the question before us is this. What is the structure of the kingdom of God? Who's in charge? What goes on in the kingdom of God? Uh, who does the stuff that they do? Uh, how is the society structured? Who is in it? Who are the residents or the subjects of the kingdom of God? This summer, we're going to be walking through the Sermon on the Mount, which is this big sermon that Jesus spoke to the people who, who were following him, and it really is a description of what the kingdom of God is like. It's a description of, of what life is like in the kingdom of God. So we're calling it Summer on the Mount. Today I've entitled my sermon, The Upside Down Kingdom. So Jesus begins his sermon this way. Read with me in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. But before we read, let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we come before you this morning. Lord, we admit that without your help, we cannot understand your word. Lord, we admit that without your help, we can't know what it means to live in the kingdom. Father, we ask this morning that you would be with us. Lord, that you would help us as we seek to understand your word. Lord, use my mouth to speak your words, not my own. Father, as we read your word, open our eyes that we might see, unstop our ears that we might hear, and soften our hearts that we might understand. We pray this in Jesus' name, so we know you hear us. Amen. This is God's word. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you. When they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me, be glad and rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word. 
When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up, sat down, and began to teach them. This is the transition passage from what we talked about last week where the crowds were gathering around Jesus because he was preaching and teaching and healing and he was doing all these incredible things and people saw what he was doing and they reported throughout all their surrounding regions. And when people heard the reports, they heard it and they came and then they brought others to him. So Jesus had this giant crowd around him because he was healing people and casting out demons and then he, seeing the crowd, he walked up on this mountainside and sat down and began to teach them. To teach them about the, the kingdom of heaven. Remember, last week we talked about what Jesus was teaching. He was teaching the good news, the gospel about the kingdom of God. That the rule and reign of God was coming to the hearts of men and women. So, when he came up, he sat down on this mountain, he began to teach them about this kingdom, what life looked like in this kingdom, what the kingdom was going to be about. And he started by giving a description of who is in the kingdom, what the kingdom looked like. That's what these beatitudes are. But first, let's talk about this word beatitude. Many of us have, have heard the term beatitude. We've, we've, we know that there's a list of things in Matthew about these people who are, who are blessed, or your translation might say happy but when we talk about beatitude or, or blessedness or happiness, we're talking about a theme that is central throughout much of the scripture. It's not, a th it's not just happiness, the emotion, but it's, a, it's something much more than that. The Old Testament uses this language of, of blessedness or, or happiness. If in Psalm 1, it says, how happy are those who do not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of of mockers. Happiness or, or blessedness is this concept that's used in the scriptures to describe people who are, who are in relationship with God. They are God's people. They are following God's law. They are in God's kingdom. But when we hear this term blessedness, when we think about what it means to be blessed in the, in the concept of scripture, I don't want us to think about blessedness like some may talk about it. To be blessed is not to own fancy cars and land and have money and power and health. The idea of blessedness is that one is content or happy with whatever situation they find themselves in. True blessedness is, is not longing to have more, but it's the understanding of that we are blessed now. No matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, because we are in the kingdom and care of God. The blessedness described by our Lord here is not health, wealth, and power. What's described here is the idea that we are blessed. We can be happy with our situation no matter how crummy or not ideal the situation is. Blessedness is that we will be blessed by being residents of the kingdom of God when that kingdom is realized in the future. Blessedness. So, who are these people? Who is it that is going to, to be a part of the kingdom of God? Who are they? Who are the people that Jesus is describing? These folks that are in the kingdom of God that Jesus describes as blessed, well, there are two kind of main descriptors that, that are used here. They're, the first few verses talk about who the people are, what they desire, and the last few verses talk about what the people do. So I want us to just kind of walk through them section by section and talk about who these people are, and then we're going to come back and talk about how that applies to our lives today. So look with me here at the first. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. These are not those who have it all together. It's not those that believe that their lives are perfectly in order or they have everything put together. The poor in spirit are not even those who have few earthly possessions. No, the, the poor in spirit are those who see their place in the kingdom of God. And they acknowledge that the reason they're there is not because they earned it. It's the people who 
who are in the kingdom of God, who see this blessing of being a part of the kingdom as a true gift. They are poor in spirit because they recognize that it's nothing that they did that got them to this kingdom. They didn't buy their way into the kingdom with their money or their good works. They, they knew that they were in need of a savior. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Those who mourn, those who are at the bottom, the ones who have experienced something which has caused them to grieve, it's a picture of those who need help and recognize it. We don't mourn when we think we've got everything under control. We don't mourn when we think our lives are, are perfectly put together, but to mourn is to realize that we need help and to acknowledge it. These are the people who realize that, that not only do they need help, but the world around them needs help. That because of their sin, the, the personal sin and the sin of the nation, they grieve over it. To be people who mourn is people who admit they need help. What, what Jesus is really describing here is, is the opposite of someone who who thinks they've got everything put together, who thinks that they can build their own kingdom by themselves. I mean, it would be kind of like getting a, a cut on your arm and not cleaning it uh, and ignoring it even when it, when it starts to hurt and when the cut becomes infected and you still ignore it and you think it will go away, not realizing or not admitting that if left untreated, it will harm you. Those who mourn are those who admit that there is something wrong. Those who acknowledge that, that they need someone else to help and fix their issue. And the promise here from God is that those who mourn, those who admit their, their need, those who realize the gravity of sin and seek help, that they will be comforted. We get a picture of a father who will bind up their wounds. Blessed are those who mourn. Next, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. What is humility? I mean, a humility is one of those things that, that Christians and non-Christians alike like to brag about having. And there's, there's something contradictory in even that statement. It's, it, being humble is not to, to think highly of yourself, but to be humble is to, to realize your real station in life. We're describing the same thing in each of these, these first three descriptions. It's these people who realize who they are. Humility comes from the, the, same, the same word of the idea of humiliation. Not to think too highly of yourself. To be humble is to, to realize where you are. And I'm not talking about that 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 faux sense of humility that some people have where they brag about how humble they are. That's a thing that we do sometimes in Christian circles where, where we, we try to let people know how humble we are. But to be humble is to realize that I can't do it on my own. To be humble is to realize the gravity of my sin and the fact that that disqualifies me from being in the kingdom of God. To be humble is to realize that the work we do, the righteousness that we produce, those good things that we do that we think we're, we're serving the church or we're, we're helping God out to realizing that those things really aren't worth anything. To be humble is to realize that, that God has to do the work, that we in our own selves are inadequate to enter the kingdom of God except by the work of his son Jesus. Today, we can rest in the fact that, that God has done the work, that through his death and resurrection, we can rest easy in the fact that he has fulfilled this promise that even in our humility, in our lowly state, we can enter the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This one is, is one that it's, it gets me. Because I, I, the one who hungers and thirsts is not one that thinks they have arrived. You know, sometimes we think about the Sermon on the Mount, we think about G- Jesus calling people to be holy. People call, he's calling people to be righteous. He's calling people to, to act right. And that's not really what he's describing here. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are the folks who know that they have not arrived. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are the ones that, that realize that they haven't attained righteousness yet. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who know that they still need more. The ones who realize that they lack holiness, the ones that know that they are not holy, the ones that know that they are sinners. And if I can be honest for a moment, this is one of those things that I have to constantly repent of. Even as I was writing this sermon this week, I realized that, that I often feel like I've arrived, that I often feel like I've got the, the righteousness. I mean, I'm the, I'm the pastor, right? I feel sometimes I, I get this, this mindset that, you know, I think I've got it, right? I, I'm, I'm at church all the time. I think I've got the righteousness I need, but I'm reminded as I go back to the Scriptures, as I see Jesus, as I, as I see what He has commanded, what He demands of us, that I have not arrived, that I still need God's forgiveness in my life, and I still need Him to work on me to produce holiness and righteousness. We all still need to grow and to trust God to provide that growth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because the promise is that they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. What does it mean to be merciful? What is mercy? For those who are in the church, we, we say this word a lot, we sing this word, we we, we read this word, we talk about what it means to be merciful, but we don't often stop to define it. Mercy is simply not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not receiving the, the punishment that you deserve. Mercy is, is treating those who, who you interact with how you would want to be treated, despite what they owe you. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is one of those things where we, we talk about the, the actions of the people of the kingdom of God. They extend mercy. That even when they're, they're owed something, that they treat others with respect. They treat them how they want to be treated. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And you know, one of the things when we, we show mercy, we show it often because it has been shown to us. You know, if we have been shown such great mercy because of Jesus Christ, because the wages of sin is death, that means that what we are owed, what we rightly deserve is punishment, separation from God for all eternity. But God shows us his mercy in that he does not give that to us. He shows us his mercy in that even though we deserve death, he doesn't give it to us immediately. Even though we are owed it, even though we deserve it, he doesn't give it to us. And thus, as people who have received mercy, as people of the kingdom, we are to extend mercy to those who we come in contact with. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is another one of those characteristics that flows plainly from the other ones. It, it is the, the same idea, but worded just a little bit differently. What is seen here is something that is completely contradictory to the outside world. You see, in the, the kingdom, it's not just about outward behavior that matters. Sometimes in our world today, it doesn't really matter what our motivations are. It's only about my, my output. What do I do? 
But in the kingdom of God, it's not just about what you do, it's about the motivations of why you do it. So he says, blessed are the pure in heart. It's, it's the main, it's one of the, the structures of the beatitude because it's not just about did you show mercy. It's not just about do you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not just about are you mourning. It's about why are you doing these things. It really calls us to consider why each of these, these aspects are a part of our lives. You see, if you're pure in heart, you are not showing mercy just so you can get something out of someone else. If you're pure in heart, you're not trying to present yourself as humble so that other people will think well of you. If someone is pure in heart, they are growing in the wisdom and knowledge of God, and they're doing so not so that they can have other people look at them and, and attain some position, but the pure in heart do so so that they might know God and serve Him better. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Read that again. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Remember, we're describing a a kingdom here, and let's put ourselves back in the first century when Jesus is is talking. We think about the, the kingdom or the empire of Rome, the power and the might of Rome. Think about the other the empires in, in that age and the ages that follow. What a, how do empires and kingdoms continue their reign? They go off and they make more war with other kingdoms. They go out and they, they fight others and they seek to establish their reign by dominance. And we think about a king, how do his sons attain to this position, their generals and his army? I want you to look at how the, how the kingdom, the sons of God are described in his kingdom. The sons of God are not those who go off and make war with others. The sons of God are not those who seek seek to dominate others for the sake of their own name. No, the sons of God are those who show God's characteristics. Our God is a God of peace. Those who are called sons of God love what God loves. And that is peace. This kingdom of God is not advanced by military force. It's advanced by people making peace with God and with one another. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I called this message the Upside Down Kingdom, and that's not my own idea. A pastor named Tim Keller said that first. But the, the idea of the, the Upside Down Kingdom is this. When we look at the world, and we look at kingdoms, and we look at people who are in charge, we see something totally upside down of what we see in the kingdom of God. We remember Jesus saying, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's the same thing. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. It's not those who are in power that are blessed. It's not the ones who are maintaining control who are blessed. It's not those at the top who are blessed, but those who are at the bottom, those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Those who desire righteousness so much that they are willing to die. Those who elevate following God's law above even their own well-being. Who is it that lives in the kingdom of God? Who Who are the residents? How does it work? What's the structure? Today, we need to understand that the kingdom of God is not about how good we are, not about how powerful we are, not about how much we have done, not about how strong we are. It's about God's work and not our own. It's not about those who who have it all together. It's for the poor in spirit. It's not about the ones who are happy and who believe that they are okay. It's about those who mourn over their sin. It's not about the people who are proud for their many accomplishments. It's for the humble It's not about those who who believe they have all the righteousness they need. 
It's about those who continually hunger and thirst and long to be like God. It's not about those who take everything they're owed. It's for the merciful. The kingdom is is not for those who will do anything to attain the goal they desire. It's about those who are pure in heart. It's not about those who, who cause conflict to get their own way. It's about those who seek peace. The kingdom of God is not about those who are in power at the top of the hierarchy, but, but those who are persecuted for the sake of Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to try really, really hard to be people who are like this? I think that's exactly the opposite of what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to, to try our hardest to be righteous. It's about admitting our faults and trusting in Jesus. It's about admitting that no matter how hard we try to be good and try to be holy and try to be religious and try to live as God belongs to us, if, we, if we're trying in our own strength, we're missing it. The kingdom of God is not about the people who try really hard. You can't do it. I've tried. (laughs) And you might be a lot stronger than I am. The kingdom of God is not about the powerful. It's not about those who who live good lives by the sheer white knuckling it. The kingdom of God is for the people who admit that they need a Savior. The people who know their station in life. The people who know that I am a sinner and I have offended a holy God. And I rightly deserve death. I rightly deserve the punishment to be separated from God for all eternity. I need to put my faith in Jesus. The only one who's lived a a truly righteous and perfect life. To know that there is no ritual or or sacrament or anything that I can do to attain my salvation. It's all about what Jesus has already done. Today, I offer that grace to you. Not me, but Christ. And I do this every Sunday. Not because I think that some of you aren't saved, but because even... Those of us who have been saved for a long time need to hear that gospel over and over again. To be reminded that it's not about us. That it's not our strength that did it, but it's only what God has already accomplished. We're going to pray in just a moment. And if you need to, to pray with someone, my, I will be here. Pastor Garrett, Brother Nick will be here. If you need to come pray by yourself, our altar is open. But as your musicians play, I just ask you to, to take time, and I'm going to ask you to, to stay seated and reflect. Reflect on the goodness of Jesus and what he has done on your behalf. Reflect on the kingdom and that it, it is gained not by us trying really hard, but what God has already accomplished. If you need to come and pray, I will be here to receive you. The altar is available, but let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, thank you that we get to call you Father. Thank you that you didn't just leave us in our in our broken state, Lord. That that you didn't just you didn't just leave us alone when when you rightfully could have. Lord, even in our brokenness, you sent Jesus to come. To live a life that we could not. To die a death in our place and rise from the grave. And Lord, thank you for inviting us in repentance and faith to put our faith in him. And have assurance that we we are in your kingdom. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for for trying to to white-knuckle and and produce my own righteousness. Lord, I I admit that it's, it's, it's nothing. You call it filthy rags. Help me to trust your righteousness.
Father, as we take time to reflect, to respond, I ask that you would guide us. Give us wisdom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.